Section 5 of Astounding Stories, 11, November 1930. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Pirate Planet by Charles W. Diffin. Chapter 2. Lieutenant McGuire, USA, was not given as a usual thing to vain conjectures, nor did his imagination carry him beyond the practical boundaries of accepted facts. Yet his mind, as he drove for hours through the orange-scented hills of California, reverted time and again to one persistent thought, and it was with him still, even when he was consciously concentrating on the hairpin turns of Mount Lawson's narrow road. There was a picture there, printed indelibly in his mind, a picture of a monstrous craft, a liner of the air, that swung its glowing lights in a swift arc, and, like a projectile from some huge gun, shot up and up and still up until it vanished in a jet-black sky. Its altitude when it passed from sight he could not even guess, but the sense of ever-increasing speed, of power that mocked at gravitation's puny force, had struck deep into his mind and McGuire saw plainly this mystery ship going on and on far into the empty night where man had never been. No lagging in that swift flight that he had seen, an acceleration that threw the ship faster and yet faster, regardless of the thin air and the lessened buoyancy in an ocean of atmosphere that held man-made machines so close to earth. That constant acceleration, hour after hour, day after day, the speed would be almost unlimited, inconceivable. He stopped his car where the mountain road held straight for a hundred feet, and he looked out over the coastal plain spread like a toy world far below. "'Now, how about it?' he asked himself. "'Blake thinks I am making a fool of myself. Perhaps I am. I wonder. It's a long time since I fell for any fairy stories. But this thing has got me. A sort of hunch, I guess.' The sun was shining now from a vault of clear blue. It was lighting a world of reality, of houses where people lived their commonplace lives, tiny houses squared off in blocks a mile below. There was smoke here and there from factories. It spread in a haze, and it meant boilers and engines and sound practical machinery of a practical world to the watching man. What had all this to do with Venus? he asked himself. This was the world he knew. It was real. Space was impenetrable. There were no men or beings of any sort that could travel through space. Blake was right. He was on a fool's errand. They couldn't tell him anything up here at the observatory. They would laugh at him as he deserved. Wondering vaguely if there was a place to turn around, he looked ahead and then up. His eyes passed from the gash of roadway on the mountainside to the deep blue beyond and within the man some driving, insistent mental force etched strongly before his eyes that picture and its problem unanswered. There was the ship. He saw it in memory, and it went up and still up, and he knew as surely as if he had guided the craft that the meteor-like flight could be endless. Lieutenant McGuire could not reason it out. Such power was beyond his imagining, but suddenly he dared to believe, and he knew it was true. Earthbound, he said in contempt of his own human kind, and he looked again at the map spread below. Ants! Mites! That's what we are, swarming across the surface of the globe, and we think we're so damn clever if we lift ourselves up a few miles from the surface. Guess I'll see Sykes, he muttered aloud. He and his kind at least dare to look out into space, take their eyes off the world, be impractical. He swung the car slowly around the curve ahead eased noiselessly into second gear, and went on with the climb. There were domed observatories where he stopped, rounded structures that gleamed silvery in the air, and offices, laboratories. It was a place of busy men, and Professor Sykes, he found, was busy. But he spared a few minutes to answer courteously the questions of this slim young fellow in the khaki uniform of the air service. "'What can I do for you?' asked Professor Sykes. No dreamer this man, thought McGuire, as he looked at the short, stocky figure of the scientist. Clear eyes glanced sharply from under shaggy brows. There were papers in his hand, scrawled over with strange mathematical symbols. "'You can answer some fool questions,' said Lieutenant McGuire abruptly, if you don't mind." The scientist smiled broadly. "'We're used to that,' he told the young officer. "'You can't think of any worse ones than those we have heard. Have a chair.' McGuire drew a clipping from his pocket. It was the newspaper account he had read, and he handed it to Professor Sykes. 
"'I came to see you about this,' he began. The lips of Professor Sykes lost their genial curve. They straightened to a hard line. "'Nothing for publication,' he said curtly. As usual, they enlarged upon the report, and made assumptions and inferences not warranted by facts. "'But you did see that flash? By visual observation I saw a bright area formed on the Terminator, yes. We have no photographic corroboration. I am wondering what it meant. That is your privilege, and mine, said the scientist coldly. But it said there, McGuire persisted, that it might have been a signal of some sort. I did not say so. That is an inference only. I have told you, Lieutenant, he glanced at the card in his hand, Lieutenant McGuire, all that I know. We deal in facts up here, and we leave the brilliant theorizing to the journalists. The young officer felt distinctly disconcerted. He did not know exactly what he had expected from this man, what corroboration of his wild surmises, but he was getting nowhere, he admitted, and he resented the cold aloofness of the scientist before him. "'I am not trying to pin you down on anything,' he said, and his tone carried a hint of the nervous strain that had been his. "'I am trying to learn something.' "'Just what?' the other inquired. "'Could that flash have been a signal?' "'You may think so, if you wish. I have told you all that I know. And now,' he added, and rose from his chair, "'I must ask to be excused. I have work to do.' McGuire came slowly to his feet. He had learned nothing. Perhaps there was nothing to be learned. A fool's errand. Blake was right. But the inner urge for some definite knowledge drove him on. His eyes were serious and his face drawn to a scowl of earnestness as he turned once more to the waiting man. "'Professor Sykes,' he demanded, "'just one more question. Could that have been the flash of a, a rocket, like the proposed experiments in Germany? Could it have meant in any way the launching of a projectile, a ship, to travel earthward through space?' Professor Sykes knew what it was to be harassed by the curious mob, to avoid traps set by ingenious reporters, but he knew, too, when he was meeting with honest bewilderment and a longing for knowledge. His fists were placed firmly on the hips of his stocky figure, as he stood looking at the persistent questioner, and his eyes passed from the intent face to the snug khaki coat and the spread wings that proclaimed the wearer's work. A ship out of space, a projectile, this young man had said. Lieutenant, he suggested quietly, and again the smile had returned to his lips as he spoke. Sit down. I'm not as busy as I pretend to be. Now tell me, what in the devil have you got on your mind? And McGuire told him. Like some of your dope, he said, this is not for publication, but I have not been instructed to hush it up, and I know you will keep it to yourself. He told the clear-eyed listening man of the previous night's events, of the radio's weird call and the mystery ship. Hallucination, suggested the scientist. You saw the stars very clearly, and they suggested a ship. Tell that to Jim Burgess, said McGuire. He was the pilot of that plane. And the scientist nodded as if the answer were what he expected. He asked again about the ship's flight, and he too bore down heavily upon the matter of acceleration in the thin upper air. He rose to lay a friendly hand on McGuire's shoulder. "'We can't know what it means,' he said. "'But we can form our own theories, you and I. And anything is possible.' "'It is getting late,' he added. "'And you have had a long drive. Come over and eat. Spend the night here. Perhaps you would like to have a look at our equipment. See Venus for yourself. I will be observing her through the sixty-inch refractor tonight. Would you care to?' "'Would I?' McGuire demanded with enthusiasm. "'Say, that will be great!' The sun was dropping toward the horizon when the two men again came out into the cool mountain air. "'Just time for a quick look around,' suggested Professor Sykes, "'if you are interested.' He took the lieutenant first to an enormous dome that bulged high above the ground, and admitted him to the dark interior. They climbed a stairway and came out into a room that held a skeleton frame of steel. "'This is the big boy.' said Professor Sykes, the one-hundred-inch reflector. There were other workers there, one a man standing upon a raised platform beside the steel frame, who arranged big holders for photographic plates. The slotted ceiling opened as McGuire watched, and the whole structure swung slowly around. It was still, and the towering steel frame began to swing noiselessly when a man at a desk touched various controls. McGuire looked about him in bewilderment. "'Quite a shop,' he admitted. 
But where is the telescope? Professor Sykes pointed to the towering latticework of steel. Right there, he said. Like everyone else, you were expecting to see a big tube. He explained in simple words the operation of the great instrument that brought in light rays from sources millions of light years away. He pointed out where the big mirror was placed, the one hundred inch reflector, and he traced for the wondering man the pathway of light that finally converged upon a sensitized plate to catch and record what no eye had ever seen. He checked the younger man's flow of questions and turned him back toward the stairs. We will leave them to their work, he said. They will be gathering light that has been traveling millions of years on its ways. But you and I have something a great deal nearer to study. Another building held the big refractor, and it was a matter of only a few seconds and some cryptic instructions from Sykes until the eyepiece showed the image of the brilliant planet. The moon! McGuire exclaimed in disappointed tones when the professor motioned him to see for himself. His eyes saw a familiar half-circle of light. Venus, the professor informed him. It has phases like the moon. The planet is approaching. The sun's light strikes it from the side. But McGuire hardly heard. He was gazing with all his faculties centered upon that distant world, so near to him now. Venus, he whispered half aloud. Then to the professor, it's all hazy. There are no markings. Clouds, said the other. The goddess is veiled. Venus is blanketed in clouds. What lies underneath we may never know. But we do know that of all the planets this is the most like the Earth. Most probably is an inhabited world. Its size, its density, your weight if you were there, and the temperature under the sun's rays about double that of ours. Still, the cloud envelope would shield it. McGuire was fascinated and his thoughts raced wildly in speculation of what might be transpiring before his eyes. People, living in that tropical world, living and going through their daily routine under that cloud-filled sky where the sun was never seen. The margin of light that made the clear shape of a half-moon marked their daylight and dark. There was one small dot of light forming just beyond that margin. It penetrated the dark side, and it grew as he watched to a bright patch. "'What is that?' he inquired abstractedly. His thoughts were still filled with those beings of his imagination. "'There is a light that extends into the dark part. It is spreading.' He found himself thrust roughly aside as Professor Sykes applied a more understanding eye to the instrument. The professor whirled abruptly to his assistant. "'Phone Professor Giles,' he said sharply. "'He is working on the reflector. Tell him to get a photograph of Venus at once. The cloud envelope is broken.' He returned hurriedly to his observations, one hand sketched on a waiting pad. "'Markings,' he said exultantly. "'If it would only hold. There. It is closing. Gone.' His hand was quiet now upon the paper, but where he had marked was a crude sketch of what might have been an island. It was L-shaped, sharply bent. "'Phew!' breathed Professor Sykes, and looked up for a moment. "'Now that was interesting.' "'You saw through?' asked McGuire eagerly. "'Glimpsed the surface? An island?' The scientist's face relaxed. "'Don't jump to conclusions,' he told the aviator. "'We are not ready to make a geography of Venus quite yet. But we shall know that mark if we ever see it again. I hardly think they had time to get a picture. And now there is only a matter of three hours for observation. I must watch every minute. Stay here if you wish. But,' he added, "'don't let your imagination run wild.' Some eruption, perhaps, this we have seen. An ignition of gases in the upper air, who knows? But don't connect this with your mysterious ship. If the ship is a menace, if it means war, that is your field of action, not mine. And you will be fighting with someone on Earth. It must be that some country has gained a big lead in aeronautics. Now I must get to work. I'll not wait, said McGuire. I will start for the field. Get there by daylight, if I can find my way down that road in the dark. Thanks a lot. He paused a moment before concluding slowly. And in spite of what you say, Professor, I believe that we will have something to get together on again in this matter. The scientist, he saw, had turned again to his instrument. McGuire picked his way carefully along the narrow path that led where he had parked his car. Good scout, this Sykes, he was thinking. And he stopped to look overhead in the quick gathering dark at that laboratory of the heavens, where Sykes and his kind delved and probed, measured and weighed, 
and gathered painstakingly the messages from suns beyond counting, from universe out there in space, that added their bit of enlightenment to the great story of the mystery of creation. He was humbly aware of his own deep ignorance as he backed his car, slipped it into second, and began the long drive down the tortuous grade. He would have liked to talk more with Sykes, but he had no thought as he wound round the curves how soon that wish was to be gratified. Part way down the mountainside he again checked his car where he had stopped on the upward climb, and reasoned with himself about his errand. Once more he looked out over the level ground below, a vast glowing expanse of electric lights now, that stretched to the ocean beyond. He was suddenly unthrilled by this man-made illumination, and he got out of his car to stare again at the blackness above, and its myriad of stars that gathered and multiplied as he watched. One brighter than the rest winked suddenly out. There was a constellation of twinkling lights that clustered nearby, and they too vanished. The eyes of the watcher strained themselves to see more clearly a dim-lit outline. There were no lights. It was a black shape lost in the blackness of the mountain sky that was blocking out the stars. But it was a shape, and from near the horizon the pale gleams of the rising moon picked it out in softest of outline a vague ghost of a curve that reflected a silvery contour to the watching eyes below. There had been a wider space in the road that McGuire had passed. He backed carefully till he could swing his car and turn it to head once more at desperate speed toward the mountain top, and it was less than an hour since he had left when he was racing back along the narrow footpath to slam open the door where Professor Sykes looked up in amazement at his abrupt return. The aviator's voice was hoarse with excitement as he shouted, "'It's here! The ship! It's here! Where's your phone? I must call the field. It's right overhead, descending slowly. No lights. But I saw it. I saw it!' He was working with trembling fingers at the phone where Sykes had pointed. "'Long distance!' he shouted. He gave a number to the operator. "'Make it quick!' he implored. "'Quick!' End of chapter 2